Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will be discussing the work of theaters as we emerge from the pandemic with special guests, Chad Bauman, Executive Director of Milwaukee Repertory Theater, Angela Lee Garris, Executive Director of Kansas City Rep, and Drew Ogle, Executive Director of the Nashville Repertory Theater. So thank you all for joining us. It's just great to have you here. Um, I'm going to set this up by, by just sort of pointing out that uh, we've just gone through this really tough time during COVID. Live performance, which is so essential to the repertory theater experience, was just not possible when we didn't know how transmission was happening of this, of this uh, dreaded disease. And uh, we, we uh, certainly didn't want to be infecting our audience mates or be infected by them. So now the uh, repertory theater world is opening uh, up again. So let's just sort of go around uh, and talk about how you fared and where you are now. And, and let's start with you, uh, Chad, in, in, in Milwaukee. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it's been a very difficult uh, year, I think, for everybody. Um, I think at the end of it, though, we fared uh, as best as could be expected. Uh, the uh, federal grant assistance uh, from SVOG and PPP and um, earned the earned uh, employee retention tax credit has been very helpful uh, through that process. And I think it's gonna allow our field to rebound. Um, I think we learned a lot too. Uh, I don't think there will be a full return to quote unquote normal before times. And I think that we can put into practice uh, some of those learning lessons in the future. So all in all, um, I'm really optimistic these days. It's nice to be able to be optimistic again. Uh, I think we're gonna have a really fall, a really strong fall. And Angela, how did, how did you experience that? You know, there have been a lot of um, criticisms about the, quote, free money, right, during, the, uh, during COVID. Um, but one of the big concerns that I have across uh, all sorts of business sectors, and theater is a business sector, mm -hmm. is that without such sustenance, uh, these sectors would have just completely been demolished. How did you fare? Uh, for us at Casey Rep, certainly the government um, support has helped us sustain ourselves as well as be able to get back on our feet at the end of this. Um, and I have to say, like, there are so many business sectors who lobby collectively. And I, that is one thing that I do think that our field has learned is that we have power in numbers. Um, us as an industry, not just um, theater, but dance opera, all of us together can make a difference and help our industry survive. So um, I can tell you that this industry would not have survived the way it, that the way it will serve the communities in the future without the government support. It's, um, and for Casey Rep, I mean, we are rebounding. We are starting outside in September. We will then go um, to another outdoor show in October, and then we will move back inside around November. And it was intentional. There's two reasons for that. One is COVID and not knowing where it's gonna go. And then the second is the fact that Stuart and I really took this time to think about how we could make theater matter to more people. And we created really creative partnerships with other entities in town. And so we're gonna be performing at the World War I Museum. We're gonna be performing at the Nelson Atkins. And each of those partners has been generous and helpful to us as we thought about things in a completely new way. I love your point, Angela, about the, the uh, theater and the arts being an industry because they really are. I mean, it's also the theater for the entire television industry, the entire film industry, um, the entire concert industry. Um, so the the connection between classical and and or classical forms and contemporary forms is is, is uh, really strong. Drew, uh, you in Nashville, how are you uh, treating COVID? One of the things that that I'm wondering is this whole idea of requiring uh, performers. Uh, to get vaccinated, requiring people work in, in close proximity. On the one hand, we don't want to here in America be telling other people what to do, right? We want it, We want everybody to have freedom. But there's also this question of, of risk, right? If somebody had smallpox, um, God forbid, um, we would not necessarily be wanting our actors to to uh, to uh, be exposed in that way. Um, how are you handling this? It's such an intractable issue between values and values, right? 
Well, it is, but I think you have to take a very pragmatic approach. For us, if you look at the difference in cost between producing theater with a vaccinated cast and producing theater without a vaccinated cast, really the choice becomes producing theater with a vaccinated cast or not producing at all. And so we feel like we um, owe it to our community to produce theater as safely as possible. So, you know, we had a, a very interesting response to the uh, pandemic here. If you think of the range of responses that we had in the theater industry to the pandemic, you had some theaters that chose to, um, you know, pretty much shut down and conserve resources and try to weather the storm that way. And then you had other theaters that were um, very committed to continue to deliver their traditional product, maybe in a non-traditional way, like streaming or outdoor theater. Um, we devised a middle ground here and we developed a whole roster of digital only programs. Um, we developed new content. On average, we released a new piece of content every three days during the pandemic. And we made the decision to offer all of this for free. Yeah. And so um, it, this was a successful strategy for us. We were able to keep the majority of our staff employed. We were able to contract more artists than we did in the years pre-pandemic. Um, even though it was for smaller contracts. And um, we're gonna emerge from the pandemic a larger company than we went into it. Um, and you know, the challenge for us is keeping the best of what we learned during the pandemic and fully integrating it to what we do as we go forward. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and, and Drew, if you can just continue, could you talk about what a repertory theater is? as opposed to other uh, theatrical forms. Because this whole idea of producing new material every three days, mm -hmm. that is really part and parcel of what a rep does, isn't it? It is, if you go <clears throat> all the way back to the traditional form of repertory theater, where you have a company of actors, a company of artists producing ongoing content, I wanna be transparent and say Nashville Rep is not a full repertory model. We're a hybrid between repertory and online. Or, uh, or the line production. So um, we have some resident artists, but we rely heavily on contract artists. The difference for us though, is that our contract artists are almost exclusively local. We are very committed to being an economic driver and a driver of quality of life um, here in Nashville. And so we have the same impact as a traditional repertory model. And uh, Angela, um, how are you looking at the, at the repertory model uh, over in Kansas City? Well, we started as a repertory company over the summer and, and all the actors were the same and they would do different um, shows in rep. And I, you know, I think as theater has evolved, um, as these organizations got bigger, we found that the repertory model was a little more expensive to produce. And so many of us, um, did not necessarily use it in the same way. But what I like to think of a repertory company is that our company's um, ability to produce all different types of theater, being able to show somebody what Shakespeare is like and a brand new play, and really the breadth and the um, depth of theater and what options there are. And that's kind of how we view it. We definitely have um, a company of actors who are very well known to our uh, community, who they love and they adore and they've watched grow over years. Um, we're very proud of Kansas City artists and them being able to make a living here um, and being able to have a contract with Casey Rep helps that. Um, and so it, it certainly, I think our, our view of what Rep was originally and what it is today is a little bit different, but I think it serves the same purpose of being able to be in service to a community and have them develop relationships with artists. I think that, that what you're both saying is that purity has a, uh, comes at a cost sometimes of doability and uh, financial doability and, and perhaps also quality and diversity. Chad, are you finding the same thing that this sort of pure model of a rep um, doesn't quite um, uh, suit the, the uh, requirements of today? Or are you more of a purist in, uh, over in Milwaukee? No, I've actually worked for two companies now that have disbanded their repertory companies, Milwaukee Rep being one, Arena Stage being the, the previous one. And I think the repertory model has a fatal flaw in it. Back in the 50s and 60s, when many of these companies <clears throat> were put together, you had playwrights that were predominantly white and male 
uh, writing for companies that were almost exclusively white. Um, if you take a look at Milwaukee Rep, we produce 15 productions with 700 performances across four different theaters, ranging from uh, new works to musicals to whatever the case may be. If you're trying to produce uh, work that is representative of the rich diversity of your city, I think having a, uh, a repertory company is very difficult to do it unless you have an extraordinarily large repertory company like you see at Stratford or uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, so from our, our perspective, much like uh, my colleagues here, we have uh, local artists that we support, uh, that we see on our stages quite a bit, but we also believe it's our function to develop uh, talent all over the country and uh, to uh, produce work that is representative of the city's diverse populations. And to do so, I think we had to abandon the repertory model. How do you, how do you poll your audience? And I don't mean literally poll, going out with forms and asking people to fill out forms, but how do you, how do you get a sense of what the audience would welcome, including what the audience who does not come would welcome, that would attract them? Angela, how, how, how do you do that? How do you figure out what you want to do next that isn't a repeat of what you did last year? Um, I think history helps us a lot, but we also um, are fairly robust market researchers and being able to not just um, poll our audience, but also have lists of other arts attenders, people who are not attendees of Casey Rep, and being able to gather information from them to understand we are really lucky in Kansas City that the arts organizations are very collaborative in um, being able to share information, um, we have something uh, that was called the uh, the Fab Arts Collab, and and it was we did marketing research together. We did, and we found overlap in different arts organizations and what what percentage of our audience were overlapping. And I think that that has actually um, been the best way for us. Is you already have people who are predisposed to attend the arts. How do you find out what they would be interested in? and um, go to them and be able to do things. And at Casey Rep, the biggest thing that we're gonna be doing this year is we're taking theater out into the community to reduce the barriers. Um, so that people who have not been able to attend our theater in our spaces are able to go out and um, see live theater. And, and let's let's stay on this, this idea of diversity, Drew. You know, if you look at Nashville, Nashville is such a crossroads of the arts and of, of music. But it's also undeniable that um, Nashville for many years basically um, filtered out um, uh, uh, musicians who were of color, particularly African-American uh, musicians. Um, that has changed and it's, it, it is still a work in progress. How do you uh, ensure that your theatrical productions are considering audiences, not only who are your um, your uh, audiences of yesteryear, but also the audiences that live and work and play around Nashville. I'm going to answer your question by also piggybacking on what Angela just said. Um, we're in the middle of a, an extensive strategic planning process. And one of the elements of that for us has been to uh, really solicit community input from the very beginning. And we started with general wide surveys. Um, we had about 700 people that participated at that phase. And that turned into a series of about 12 focus groups. Um, all it, the, this was comprised of the patrons who already uh, engaged with National Rep and then also people that we wanna see engage with National Rep. And so having that diversity of voices at the table has enabled us to uh, incorporate it in everything from strategic planning uh, to season planning to in education and engagement programs as well. What did you hear that was surprising that that might have been um, either surprising in, in a good way or surprisingly critical? Well, you know, theater as an industry has a long history of proclaiming to be inclusive, but instead in our practices being exclusive. And the thing that I learned that I did not realize going into it is that before we ever get to the point where we are investigating our policies and procedures and our programs to see if any of them have any uh, unintended or inherent uh, racist qualities, we have a trust problem. 
And we have to earn the trust of our artists and our audiences of color before we can ever begin to truly serve them. Trust, uh, Chad, are you, do you, uh, does that resonate with you? Do you feel like you are a trusted and embraced uh, organization by all the people who you'd like to be trusted and embraced by? No, I think that all of our organizations are learning and growing and, and trying to build and increase trust. I do think that uh, trust is critical to a nonprofit uh, arts organization. We are based in our communities. We are representative of our communities. Uh, I do think that we have uh, made decisions as uh, almost all arts organizations have in the past that uh, if we were to go back and redo them, we would uh, redo them. But I think uh, where we're at today is that, uh, you know, we have committed uh, to being uh, serving our communities. Each community is different and um, extraordinary in, in many different ways and to using uh, the theatrical um, venues and, and performances to uh, better our communities. And so I think maybe some of that has changed a little bit in the last uh, 10 to 20 years where uh, it used to be that uh, artistic, pro an artistic product is still up there, but it used to be the only measure uh, of success of, of uh, theaters. And now we're really starting to think about uh, success metrics based on how we can um, help push our, our uh, communities forward. Um, we just finished a poll, which was uh, very interesting. Um, we asked, uh, how important is it to you to be able to attend live theater performances? And we had 33% say very important, and I, uh, I regularly attend a theater performance. And, and 56 said a few times uh, um, during the year. Um, uh, one person uh, did say that they, they attended uh, periodically, but, but not high on a uh, list of priorities. Nobody said they don't attend uh, theater. So let's talk about live performance, Angela. What is it about live performance that we have to preserve that is so distinctive from the screen performances that we see? I mean, we've seen Hamilton and several other, uh, particularly during, during the pandemic, right? We've had to go on to Zoom and, and perform in that way. Uh, what is it about live and how do you accentuate the live experience going forward? so that it remains so distinctive and so gratifying to both the actors and the audience? Uh, I think during this time, we found why live matters. I think the disconnection that we all had with each other um, made it so that what matters most about theater is being in the space with your community, with the people who you care about, um, who have a commonality with you. You're all sitting in those seats and there's something that you have in common. Um, and so I, for us, we did several shows. We streamed several shows. We did not find that streaming was in any way a duplicate for the work that we do. Um, we did do a beautiful production um, with our KCPBS station here for Christmas Carol. And again, it just wasn't the same as being in the room with us. Um, I think there is something about um, the in the roomness, and this is Stuart Carden, my artistic director's word for it, is that th there is an energy, a, a space that happens, an electricity that happens between the actors, between the audience, between the other audience members that cannot be mimicked when you're sitting there watching Netflix. Um, as good as a movie is, and there are some pieces that I watched over and over during the pandemic, it's not the same. And, and I love people bringing up Hamilton because the reality is that was a over a million dollar television production. There is almost no way for us to do that in a repertory company in our communities because it's just not, um, first of all, we're not filmmakers. And that is a very special skill that we all learned how to do this past year. But yeah, it, I, I think that the in the roomness is the thing that makes theater so special and, and it's personal. It's one-on-one, -on -one, it's a connection between actors and audience. The thing that I found so interesting about Ham Hamilton was really the form uh, as well as, um, as how, the how the audience interacted with the actors because you had this, this, um, this uh, group of people who were giving a performance together, but they were also giving individual performances as well. There right. was a lot of interaction. If you take a look at, at how uh, people were moving on the stage, mm -hmm. it's very interesting because there was a lot of drawing into that experience, that particular performance, but the performance in and of itself within the performance connected 
right? Yes. So you have a different way of interacting with the audience that, that elicits that kind of energy. Uh, too often, what I'm finding in, in, uh, as, as theater has become, it's simply become a, another um, sort of staging of almost behind the screen um, kind of, kind of uh, presentation in which there is a separation. Uh, Drew, when you look at what you're shaping on the stage over at Nashville Rep, how do you draw it? You talked about the fact that you, during the pandemic, where you were you were delivering uh, new performances every three days. How do you draw the audience in and make the audience feel like they are part of that, particularly when you're talking about audiences that you want to be diverse, so they're going to come to you with different lived experiences and you've got a diversity of views right there sitting in that theater uh, that need to be addressed. Well, part of it is uh, just inherent in the regional and the repertory theater model. The people that our audiences are seeing up on stage are the same people they see out in the community on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you gather them in that room together. Um, it, it creates something magical, right? And uh, we have uh, good fortune, we have two different spaces we perform in. One is a 260 seat black box and the other one is an 1100 seat proscenium house. But even that one is designed in such a way that the audience is very, very close to the actors. And it creates this intimacy, this liveness that, that simply won't be um, replicated on screen. If you think about Hamilton, it's certainly the high water mark of a, a, a uh, recorded live performance. But in reality, it was recorded over three performances and it was augmented with um, uh, not rehearsal video, but especially film segments, you know. So it was not a live performance at all. I love, I love how you studied how that, how that was put together, right? Because what you're doing is you're deconstructing something that you can't afford to do to figure out a way that you can afford to present, right? <laughs> so, uh, Chad, as, as you're looking at at how the, these more recent developments in theater affect yours, what what do you see as the most interesting elements here that you could adopt over in, uh, in Milwaukee, Rep? Yeah, I think like like my colleagues, we did a lot of filming and a lot of digital content produ production in the last year. I can't, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Angela about the specialness of the in the room experience. I do think there is a little bit of a false dichotomy that's been set up about um, live and in person versus taped and filmed. Um, there is a, an artist that we work with uh, quite a bit, uh, Jared Mazzocchi, who's doing uh, a work uh, with the Geffen right now on, I think they just closed on someone else's house, where it is a, uh, a Zoom play that has happened live in person over Zoom. And so you can have a digital live experience mix. And I'm, I'm following that work. And I actually think that there is future in that potential. Um, personally, for me, I like, like Angela said, I didn't go to film school. I went to drama school. There was a very real reason I made that decision. I, I do like live uh, production, but I do think that we can incorporate technology into live production. And I think we're going to uh, get very good at that in the future. I, I also say that I think if you're trying to financially figure out a business model to support uh, filmed production, listen, the, the Metropolitan Opera has been working on it for more than a decade and they haven't figured it out. And they're the world's largest performing arts organization. So there's no way that Milwaukee Rep's gonna figure it out. So I'm not even focused on that. I'm, uh, and also the other thought is, is we're all nonprofit theaters. If we produce something that only made sense uh, financially, none of us would be in business. So, you know, we're gonna have to raise some money and we're gonna have to experiment with this technology. Well, I'm fascinated with, with some new models. You know, Ben Donenberg over uh, at the Shakespeare Center in LA um, has been experimenting with uh, graphic novelization um, of, of Macbeth and, and creating that sort of um, literary graphic novel, theatrical experience, educational experience. Um, I can imagine that we're going to see kind of a bunraku kind of a technique. Bunraku is, is this uh, Japanese classical puppet theaters where the people who manipulate the puppets are dressed in black in order to have them go into the background. I can imagine uh, cameras being introduced on stage to create that kind of, of integrated experience, Chad, in a way that, that allows uh, people uh, to follow uh, our, our performances 
uh, when they're not in the theater, uh, to become uh, closer to, to the theater. Um, so as, as you think about uh, your investments, Angela, going forward, does this shift um, how you invest in your future in terms of uh, what you're spending money on? Every dollar is an investment in your future, right? So are you changing how you're investing in a practical way um, in your actors and your performances and your repertoire in your infrastructure uh, okay. to allow you, yourself to become more resilient um, as we move forward as a theatrical organization? Mm -hmm. I, well, I think our biggest sh shift during this time is um, embracing the idea that we could be outside. We introduced a program called Ghost Light last fall and it was something we could do in person. And we will have the second annual Ghost Light Festival this year on the lawn of the Nelson Atkins. And, um, and for us, I think the shift in resources really thinking about theater more broadly. It's not just in the two spaces that are our home, but how do we make theater more accessible to more people, make it matter to more people. And to us, that means going out not just asking people to come in. And, um, and so I think that is the biggest shift. It's both um, a shift in resource as far as how we're spending our money. And, it, and you know, being outside, you have to spend less money on set because um, you need to be able to take it down and do, do very, it has to be movable in a way. That so it's not about the building, right? It's about right. the theater. It's, right. not about, it's not about the setting, it's about the performance. Yes, the experience. And we're focusing on language-based um, text, how we can articulate something to people in a way that is meaningful, regardless of what kind of set the costumes. People love our production values at Casey Rep, and we will continue to invest in that. Um, but I think for us, being able to like go out into the community, take theater into there to not, not to immediately have an impact where we say, okay, come back to our space, but really build genuine relationships with different communities to be able to integrate theater into their lives because so many people have not been introduced to it that how do we get them to come to us? We tell them it's something that they can't live without. Um, and that's, that's our biggest shift right now. I wouldn't say um, the producing element online I, the biggest thing that we've been able to do is have artist interviews so that people could continue their relationship with our artists. And that's, that's one of the ways that we've integrated that online component as we've moved forward. So we just completed uh, two other polls. Um, one is, uh, one asked, what is the biggest problem faced by theaters that emerged from the uh, pandemic? And 57% said reestablishing the relationship with, with the audience is followed by uh, recovering financially. Drew, as you look at your future, and then we'll, we'll give the last word to Chad, as you look to your future, what changes uh, going, going into the future? Have you been able to successfully set a pattern that you think will, will see you uh, through the next several years? No, um, it's very similar to what Angela says. The biggest shift for us at this time has been changing the way we think about ourselves. We do no longer think of ourselves as a theater organization. We think of ourselves as a civic organization with theater at our core. Mm -hmm. And that, when you think that way, then it changes the way you invest in the way you reach people. And so, you know, we will use um, digital and in-person um, parallel programming with all of our main stage programming this year as both pre and post engagement to form longer term relationships with our audience members. And we and our third poll was what it, we asked, what is the best thing about uh, live performance? And uh, the, the two answers that got the most response is being physically in the same uh, room with the audience and the sense that whatever happens at this performance will only be uh, lived at this performance. Chad, how do you uh, take us out? How do you see the future of live theater uh, over in Milwaukee and nationally? Yeah, we've just put uh, tickets on sale for subscriptions and single tickets. Uh, both have been pretty robust. I think we're gonna see a very quick return uh, because if you steward your audience as well, you're gonna bring those audiences back. People have been away uh, from the theater for 18 months. They wanna come back. They wanna have a live in-person experience. I don't know how everybody else's cities are, but our restaurants are packed. Our venues are, everything is, is, we have very low infection rates and a very high percentage of vaccination. So 
we're lucky in that regard, but I think we're going to see a very strong rebound. Uh, and I also say part of our strategy is that we're investing in our people first. This is a talent-based business. We're going to take care of our staff. We're going to take care of our patrons. We're going to provide exceptional customer service, and we're going big with next year's season. It's the largest season that, th that we've produced in the eight years that I've been here. So uh, I think that's going to be an exciting time, and we're going to give people a reason to come back to the theater. And what you've all said is so important that in order for America to reopen, we really need to protect ourselves, to be vaccinated, to not go back into a Delta-driven uh, lockdown. Uh, so if everybody could just uh, find their way to getting vaccinated and certainly uh, masking up if you, if, if, uh, if you can, it would just be great. Thank you so much all for uh, sharing your experiences. Uh, Chad Bauman, Executive Director of the Milwaukee Rep, Angela Lee uh, Garris, uh, the Executive Director of Kansas City Rep, and Drew Ottle, Executive Director of Nashville Rep. It's just been such an enjoyable time with you. Uh, thank you, attendees, for coming in and, and helping out. And uh, we'll see you on, uh, on Thursday again. Thanks, all. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.